So, uh, today, uh, I've just been reminded in, in chatting in the library of a quote which I think is quite relevant for tonight's topic, and that is, the library of life is burning and we don't even know the titles of the books. So over to Alistair Curry. He is head of campaigns and communications at Population Matters. They're a UK-based charity, and what they're looking to do is to achieve a sustainable human population and in, uh, together with protecting the natural world and improving people's lives. So it's a very big challenge. Uh, before joining Population Matters in 2016, uh, his campaigning career included roles at Cruelty Free International, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, and Free Tibet. So Alistair will be examining the facts and myths about population and what can be done about it, and arguing about whether it's time now to break the taboo. So, human population and biodiversity, red herring or elephant in the room? Thank you. Thank you very much. Am I on? Yes, I seem to be on. Um, first of all, I should obviously say happy Darwin Day to everyone here. Um, I'm very pleased to say that. I didn't know it was Darwin Day until a colleague told me about six hours ago, so I'm very ashamed, but it is Darwin Day today. Um, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm actually here through the uh, persistence of one of our, um, our supporters who's, who came uh, after the People's Walk for Wildlife that Chris Packham organized here back in September and suggested that we should come here, and Elizabeth and Leanne were game for that, and here I am. So, um, when told to uh, that idea I should speak for 45 minutes, that's about twice as long as I normally speak for, um, and I was a little anxious about that. I found as soon as I started writing it that 45 minutes isn't enough, so, so I'm missing out a whole load of things I would like to be saying. Um, but hopefully what I will be saying will be interesting. And the other um, thing I should say is I'm very well aware that there will be a great many people in this room who know a huge amount more about diverse, biodiversity than I do. What I know is, is very little. Um, but hopefully um, you'll find this useful in talking uh, about that relationship with population and other matters uh, there. Um, and uh, feel free to correct any mistakes that I make uh, later on on the subject of biodiversity. So, just to start off with, um, you should know who's speaking to you. Obviously, you've just, just had uh, an introduction from Elizabeth, which kind of says this here. And I should say, I'm breaking the first rule of presentations, which has given you a lot of text on my first slide. Don't worry, they're not all like this. But essentially, we're an organization. We were founded in 1991, um, initially as the Optimum Population Trust, now known as Population Matters. And our belief is that like our current population and our current population trajectory, it's simply incompatible with a decent standard of life for everyone and for uh, a healthy and biodiverse planet. We think that's a solvable problem, but it needs to be solved urgently. We don't think it's the only solution to all the problems that we face, but we believe that action can be taken, positive ethical action on that. So what do we do? Um, these are, are the things we do. Campaign, inform, research, empower. Campaigning is about clearing the blockages out of the way that prevent people from choosing smaller families. That's, re that's really what we're about. So for instance, we have a campaign related to the Trump administration's blockage of funding to overseas family planning aid. Inform. Uh, very important part of what we do, obviously part of the reason that I'm here just now, we have a spiffy new website um, that we launched in November. Um, all the graphics and things that you'll see, Population Matters graphics, are all available on that website. Do explore it. There's obviously a lot more information than I can get in here. Um, we, uh, and information, people need to understand what's going on before they can change. Uh, and change is what we're all about. Research, we started originally very much as a think tank doing, doing a lot of research. Now we're a little bit more outward facing, so we tend not to do primary research, though, though there is an element of that, but it's about synthesizing what's out there and making sure the evidence is robust that we're using. And empower, it's a little bit of a buzzword, but, but all these other things empower people to make choices, and choice is what we're all about. We also do a little work, a small amount of work, um, supporting grassroots family planning and women's rights projects. Um, which really sort of exemplify what can be done in a very simple and small way in order to help 
bring down family size and population uh, and protect the world. Um, there. So, um, amongst our many patrons, we're very fortunate to have people with, with considerable expertise and authority on the subject of biodiversity. Um, that's just a handful. It seems a little bit absurd to actually write their names underneath, but, but it seemed rude not to at that point. And there is another one, less famous, but some people in this um, uh, room may be aware of. Uh, Professor Aubrey Manning uh, was a long-standing patron of ours. Uh, he sadly died back in November. His, um, he felt very strongly that people, he was a zoologist, that people in the biology world should speak out on what was happening, and in particular about population. Uh, hopefully you can uh, read his quote there. Anybody who has even the slightest bit of biological knowledge uh, knows that human numbers are already out of balance. His um, uh, memorial service in uh, Edinburgh in April, uh, will, will, we've been invited to take part in that, and donations um, from that will actually go partly to population matters. Uh, and this is another character um, that we have. This is Bigfoot. And in the background there is the Natural History Museum, some of you may recognize. When we took this photo, we hadn't realized that, in fact, he looks about six inches tall in that photo. Actually, he's about six feet tall. Um, and uh, where is this the little light thing? Oh, that's, that's it. Uh, what you might just be able to make out there, he's made of steel, and these little bits of him are babies. Um, and he is standing on the earth and squashing out the biodiversity. Of it. Some people have said that they think that, that they before seeing that they think that's a very kind of negative image. What we actually find is when we go out and speak to people, they love him. They think he's great. And immediately when people look at it, look at it, they get the message. They say, of course there's too many of us, of course this is, this is what's going on. It's just a way of sort of articulating that. So that's us. Now what I want to do is just give a little bit of background, a bit of framework on population before we go on to talk about biodiversity. Um, Human, many of you will be familiar with this. Human population was flat for a very long time. We didn't hit a billion people until around about the time of Napoleon. Um, I was born around about there. I don't, I'm not as young as I used to be, but the Earth's population has doubled in the time that, I, that I've been alive. Um, and, it's, and it's a scary graph. Now, as, as often pointed out, that doesn't mean it will keep going on like that forever. But some of you may have heard that population is going to flatten out. It's not or not anytime soon. These are the latest UN projections. Uh, this is the median projection here, which is the main one that you'll hear talked about. You'll see that it actually hasn't peaked by the end of the century, by 2100. In fact, the UN says there's only a one in four chance of population having peaked by the end of the century. That's 11.2 billion is, uh, is a projection, which is 30% more than we have at the moment. That's a 95% certainty range. It could be as high as 13 billion. Uh, in that point. What that means in practice is about 80 million new people being added to the planet every, every year, something the size of uh, a nation the size of Germany, about uh, more people born per second than, than I could actually <laughs> recite to you, to you. It's the, the speed is that great. So we are not plateauing soon unless we do something about it. Um, however, this shows, uh, this is part of the reason why I'm showing you this is to, don't worry about all the details, but it shows the most populous countries where we are and how things are changing. Uh, and you'll see things are going in various, uh, various directions there. Um, but it's quite important in thinking about population uh, growth. Uh, and in particular, like look at Nigeria, most population growth that's going to take place over the next 50 years or so is going to take place in Africa. Now, in fact, what, if we then look here, this is fertility rate, and we come to realize that people don't necessarily understand that. Fertility rate isn't anything medical to do with being the ability to have children. It's how many children, uh, a projection of how many children a, a woman would have in a particular country or a particular place over her, uh, at that given time over her um, period, of, period of fertility. And you can see here that in most cases, Fertility is coming down, the one exception up the top there. Um, China is, has, has reversed its one-child policy, uh, and it should be very clear that we don't support coercive policies of any kind. But if you look down at the bottom here in Nigeria, you can see how much Nigeria's fertility rate is coming down. But if we go back, oh, wrong way, not intuitive. Uh, there, you can see how much its population is going up. 
And that's amongst many other reasons because it's got a very, very young population. It takes a long time for fertility rate decline to turn into population decline. And that's really important because that's why there's such urgency to deal with it. Because people who are born next week will, we hope, be living for 70 or 80 years and they will be having an impact for 70 or 80 years. So, now I just want to give a wider framework. This, is, this phrase is from the uh, Living Planet Report, WWF and ZSL, which I'm going to be drawing on quite a lot. It talks about the great acceleration and exploding human consumption underlying all the problems. You can't talk about human consumption without talking about the number of consumers. It's really fundamental. Of course, the way we behave changes things, and we'll look at that. But one of the reasons we have so much consumption is because there are so many consumers. All of these containers contain things that eventually end up in some way for people and serve people. And it is very disappointing that the Living Planet Report doesn't make that um, case as explicitly as it could. But again, we'll come back to that. It does, however, make these cases. Currently, we all know that we're plundering oil uh, and non-renewable resources, but our renewable resources, healthy so uh, soil, fresh water, um, uh, uh, trees, wood, uh, fish, though, as a previous animal rights activist, I certainly don't see fish as a resource, but nevertheless, and we're currently using more than the Earth can sustain, 1.7 times what the Earth can provide us with, three by 2050, unless things change. This is also taken from the Living Planet Report. These, these you may not be able to read every detail. The Living Planet Report has about 15, probably, of these individual graphs all lined up, all lined up like that. far too many to get on a single slide. They all show the same curve. We've got carbon dioxide, tropical forest loss. They all map onto population pretty well. But the fact that we're causing this trouble doesn't mean we're all causing it equally. And it's a very important issue to do with, pop to do with population. The impact that we have varies hugely depending on where we are. We may feel smug in this country that if everyone lived the way we do, we'd only be using three Earths, and where it's in America, it's five Earths. But, we are, but the way we live right here, right now, is clearly unsustainable. And when we talk about population, it's easy to get hung up on somewhere like Nigeria, which has got this zooming popula population growth. But numbers of people and our impact matters hugely where you are. And I'll, again, I'll come back to talk about that a little bit later. And this is one way of looking at the change, the great acceleration here. Weight of vertebrate land animals. You can read it for yourself. 10,000 years ago, there was almost nothing but wild animals. Today, the earth is owned by us and the cows that we kill and eat. 1% um, left for wild animals. Now, actually, there are a variety of different interpretations, calculations on this. Some say it might be as high as 4, as four or 5% of wild animals uh, left, but I think the point, the point is made. So, on to biodiversity. Uh, this is a, that's a poison frog, by the way. Just be warned should you, should you come across one. Um, Fundamental biodiver biodiversity message, which I'm sure a, a lot of you will be aware of. In fact, since we had this graphic made, the living, next Living Planet report came out, and it's 60% loss of vertebrate species, of populations, not number of species, but actually of populations, uh, since 1970, when the population was about half what it, what it is today. And that's really the, sort of the fundamental piece of information. Again, you can read these for yourselves, but the 41% of insect species declining, some of you may have seen this that's from a paper that was published earlier this week, um, uh, which we'll come back to, and this news just keeps coming out. The rest of it is from the Living Planet Report. Uh, you can see how catastrophic things are in Central and South America in fresh water. Current rate of extinction, 100 to 1,000 times uh, the background rate. I'm sure many of you are very familiar with this. Again, a, text, a slide with a lot of text on it, but I could give you a lot of facts and figures, but actually I think it's more salutary to see what people are saying about the state of biodiversity on the planet. Biological annihilation, driving the planet to the very brink, mass extinction event in which current forms of life could be annihilated, catastrophic consequences for the planet's ecosystems and for the survival of mankind. No, I'm sure people in this room aren't in any doubt, but no one can be in any doubt about the extent of the crisis. We're in the library is indeed burning. So what are, the, what are the threats? What are the reasons for it? And this is where we can talk about population a little bit more. I'm not going to go into all of these here. I'm just going to concentrate on a, on a couple. Um, but you can see, we can see when we look at these how in every case, apart from fish, it is habitat degradation and loss. 
that is, that is one of the, it's a primary driver, though not the only one of these changes that we're seeing. Habitat loss. Um, you can read the third point there. Only a quarter of Earth on that land on Earth is substantively free of the impacts of human activities. Overwhelmingly, that's agriculture. And that, um, these two figures at the top were ones I just found when I was doing my research uh, for this presentation. It's pretty shocking, the impact of agriculture. And I want to talk about agriculture in a little bit more depth because there have been two very, very important recent um, uh, reports looking uh, at agriculture uh, and its sustainability, and it's so fundamental to this subject. Um, the first came out in uh, December, creating a sustainable food future. You can see there's some pretty uh, um, authoritative people, World Bank, UN, involved with that, and it came from an organization called the World Resources Institute. And we know at the moment that about 850 million people don't get enough to eat. About 2 billion people are overweight or obese. Um, so we need to get the nutrition levels up, obviously, on a great ma uh, many people. But still, by 2050, we've got a gap. We have to fill in 56% of, uh, of the calories that people will, people will need by then, driven by population growth. People talk about need and greed. Food is need. It's not greed. We all need it. Um, we may not need Bentleys or iPhones. We need food. Now, the, this document looked at a recipe of... It's called it a menu of 22 solutions. One of them that it picked, which we're delighted by, a little bit hard to read, but down here, achieve replacement level fertility rates. It made the very obvious point. Food, when you're looking at food sustainability, you have to address demand. All these things here are, are, are about demand. But they, they were saying very, very clearly that there are things, there are positive things that we can do in order to bring down population, bring down demand, and we'll talk about more of those later on. This says achieve replacement level fertility rates. We are not close. That is obviously where population bounces out in time. We've got closer to that down the years, but we're not there yet. And in many parts of the world, uh, it's considerably different to that. This was produced in December. And then just a few weeks ago, the Eat Lancet Commission report came out, which many of you may have seen um, got uh, wide attention. One of the reasons it got a lot of attention, uh, this was asking the question, can we feed people, can we give people enough to eat in a way that doesn't destroy the earth? It got a lot of attention um, because it was saying we need to eat a tiny fraction of the amount of meat that we do just now. Again, music to my ears as a full animal rights campaigner who's been saying this for the last 25 years, um, and I hope that I don't have to wait as long as a population campaigner to see people start paying attention. But a lot of attention focused on, focused on that change in individual behavior. But in this very long report, there were just a couple of lines, which I think in many ways are possibly the most important that I'm going to show you here. Healthy diets, sustainable for up to 10 billion people, but become increasingly unlikely past this population threshold. The UN says we will pass that population threshold in about 30 years unless we do something. Let's be really clear what this is saying. It's saying we probably can't feed everyone if we go beyond the, uh, the amount of, uh, the number of people that we're currently expected to get. That's incredibly fundamental within the lifetime of certainly my son and many of us in this room. Okay, so uh, I wasn't, a, that was just a run through on agriculture because it's so important. We, obviously there's lots of other threats. Pollution is one of them. I'm not gonna talk about it in depth, um, but because there's a lot of um, in, information, a lot of talk about, about plastic pollution at the moment, just be worth bearing in mind what that is. Of course, it's a disposable throwaway culture, but there are also places where people don't necessarily have running water and they don't necessarily have the ability to throw things, or, things away. But just, re just uh, it's worth reminding, our, uh, reminding ourselves a lot of these places are obviously in less developed countries and places with high population growth. Um, high population growth makes it difficult to have an ideal waste management, management process. But that, that's just a nod to pollution. The, um, uh, I think the other word, one of the threats was to do with invasive species uh, and disease, but uh, I won't talk about that. Let's go to the big one, climate change. Again, everyone in this room will be pretty familiar with that. Um, uh, but let's remind ourselves, again, talked about consumption. You can't talk about consumption without talking about number of consumers. You can't talk about climate change without talking about number of emitters. We add more emitters. We, are going, we, are, we make it more difficult 
to, to roll back the, the climate change, the emissions that we, that we already have. And in fact, the IPCC's report, devastating report from last year, said in high population growth scenarios, it is impossible to meet the 1.5 target, which in itself, as, as I'm sure many of you know, will already cause great damage and destruction. However, as with the consumption of resources, <coughs> excuse me, we're not all equally responsible. Um, Niger here is the country in the world with the highest fertility rate. You can see 7.5 children per, per woman. Its emissions are less than one. In the US, where the, uh, the population rate is, is below replacement, uh, in other words, its, it's, um, it's population would shrink over time, its fertility rate, its uh, carbon emissions are around about 165. These are 2014 figures. They've changed slightly since then. What that means is if you can prevent one American being born, that's better for the planet than preventing 159 Nigerians being born. But we shouldn't be smug because 60 of us, <laughs> or one of us, is worth, uh, uh, stopping one of us is worth 60. And that's why, going back to my message earlier on, it's about where people are, that we make a population impact right here, even though our numbers are so much smaller, and why the obligations that there are on us. Uh, and here's another way of thinking about it. Um, so these are actions um, that help to reduce your carbon footprint that individuals in the developed world can take. Um, I don't know how readable that is at the back. Um, going car free, less than 20 times the impact of this one, having one fewer child. You can see other things that do. None of these things, of course, are bad things. And I hope all of us are, are doing all of them. Um, this does need a little bit of a health warning. The way this figure is calculated is it factors in your child's um, carbon emissions and part of their child's carbon emissions and part of their child's carbon emissions. So it's not a case that if you don't have a child, you have one fewer child next year. It saves you 58 tonnes of carbon that year. But remember, climate change isn't going away until we found a way of, um, uh, of scrubbing it out of the atmosphere emissions will still be causing problems for us in the future. And I think this is a very clear illustration of how, don't necessarily take the numbers as, as, as gospel, but of what a difference that makes, because you put another climate emitter on the planet, and it makes it tougher for all these other good things that people should be doing. And we know, the we know for another reason why population is, is an issue. In 2017, uh, a major project, international project called Project Drawdown, evaluated, uh, I think it was 80 different existing technologies, existing solutions to climate change for lowering, um, uh, uh, lowering carbon emissions. And it put tonnages and costs uh, uh, on them. So this is not something that's going to happen in the future, some amazing new technology. It's what we can do now. Um, this is the top 10 out of those 80. And you can see here, educating girls and family planning. And they're in there because you do those two things, as we'll talk about later on, and fertility rates come down, family size comes down, and population comes down. That, those two together actually achieve more than any other single action. They are more, they are more value than onshore and offshore wind turbines combined in terms of saving, you know, in terms of saving emissions. Um, do have a look at Project Drawdown. It's not, not well, enough, well enough known. But, uh, but the, one of the really key things about Project Drawdown is, it, 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 which they talked about, they described these, educating girls and family planning, as no regrets solutions. Who wouldn't want to do those? We might regret not taking a transatlantic flight or having a smaller car. Who wouldn't want to support these things? They are positive for people, the people that are engaged in every single way, and, and for all of us. Which leads me on, having been talking about some grim stuff, to solutions. Uh, possibly my favorite picture of any child apart from my own son. I love that. Um, right. The recipe for, for getting population under control is really, really simple, and it's really, really positive. End poverty when people are less poor, they have fewer kids. Empower women and girls when, they have, when women and girls have got freedom to choose. Uh, have got freedom to choose. They would normally choose smaller families. And the e economic benefits that come along uh, with empowering women also make a contribution towards preventing poverty and reducing um, family size. Education. That's education across the board for everyone, particularly women and girls. But when people uh, in um, 
Africa, for instance, someone who, ha I can't remember the figures, I should have, I should have written them down, probably someone here already knows them, um, but a woman who has a secondary education, has fewer children than someone with a primary, completed primary education, someone who has completed higher education will have fewer children than someone who has completed just secondary education. Modern family planning, everything else you do doesn't count unless people can access and freely use family, uh, family planning. There are still 200 million people in the, uh, women in the world who would, would choose not to be pregnant if they could, but who aren't using modern family planning. That may not be that they can't get hold of it, it may be that they can't afford it, it may be that they don't feel free not to use it, it may be that they're concerned about its side effects, but nevertheless, those are women who want not to be pregnant, who, if we can get that family planning and clear away all the other obstacles, um, uh, they, will be better, they would obviously be better off, as would we. Uh, and lastly, and this is really important, promote small families. All these things are stuff that we are trying to do. We're not making as much progress with many of them as we should, though there, are, there is good news about many of them. But you have to align that with letting people know the advantages of smaller families. Of course, for some people, they're very clear. Those, the, the, the women who want not to be pregnant, those 200 million women, know why they don't, they, they don't want to be pregnant. But having smaller families is understanding how it is better for everyone, for you, if, if, if that's what you prefer. But really, the days are gone in which you could say this is just a personal matter. It's not just a personal matter. The choices we make affect other people. So we have to do promoting this positively, explain to people the advantages. But you do these things, and fertility rates, family size comes down, and population follows. And these are some examples um, uh, of that. Within a, within a couple of generations, positive family planning programs, active family planning programs, women's empowerment programs, leading to these really spectacular changes. Uh, uh, this here shows, and this is about, this is also about family planning, these examples, it's not just getting people uh, richer, it's not just empowering women, it's making sure they can access those. And um, you probably can't read this uh, uh, very well, um, but it, this also compares, people talk about China's one-child policy, actually these curves are in some cases better than China's one-child policy through these positive actions. And as an illustration of what we can achieve, you saw earlier on the, um, the UN's um, projections. Those were the 95% certainty projections. This is another thing that the, UN, that the UN projects. What if, on average, there was just half a child less per woman or one, one child less per every, sec for every second family or one child more than this? That's the median projection uh, that they had earlier on. With just half a child less, you're looking at a population that's smaller than the population we have today by the end of the century. With half a child more, you're looking at 16 billion people, more than double the population that we have just now. Because the effects are cumulative of having smaller families and through the next generation and the, and the next, next generation, these things are achievable. We've looked at the positive things that can, that can achieve those, the positive steps that you can take in order, in order to achieve those. And the, we can do this try. When it comes to bio, also within the subject of biodiversity, um, there are more specific solutions to talk about. Could I just check half Earth? Who's familiar with it here? Not enough people. <laughs> okay, this was proposed by E.O. Uh, e. Wilson um, and it essentially says give half of the Earth's surface to to, to the natural, to the wild, make it keep it natural. Let's, right, um, although, as we were seeing earlier on, not that much is currently untouched by human habitation. Actually, there are still many places on Earth where it is a realistic proposal. And, and it, when I first saw this, I thought this is crazy. But actually, work has been done, and places have been identified where it's possible to achieve this. To, to, it doesn't mean wiping people out from those areas, where there's indigenous communities and, and those sorts of things. Um, people, people could stay there, but essentially giving protected status to half, half the earth. And one of the reasons I wanted to highlight this is my first thought when I saw this is if you're going to take half the world or, you know, away from people, how are we going to feed, feed 10 billion people or 7.7 or, or billion people? And the Eat Lancet report that I referred to earlier on actually included this objective in its, in its analysis. It says uh, there's a very compelling case how with this, with half the earth given over to nature, there's some things that we can't bring back, but it will have an, a massive impact on, um, on protecting and restoring biodiversity. That was one of the goals of the Eat Lancet Commission. It said we can do this and we can feed people at the same time. But um, and I'm gonna, uh, again, I'm going to come back to that report because, because it's so important. 
there are also, on a, we've been talking very much on a global level, but where biodiversity is under threat is very often somewhere that's local, where extinctions happen is very often somewhere that's local. And there is an approach to deal, to deal with that. And it's an approach to international development called um, population health and environment. And essentially it says that you can't isolate animals or plants or, what, or biodiversity from the people who, who live near it or depend, uh, depend upon it. And, and that it, you have to you have improving people's well-being, their, uh, their environments, and that can have a positive knock-on effect for biodiversity. Uh, and there are, there are lots of these project, uh, projects out there now. It's been going for some time. And these are just, just a few examples. Nature, now, PHG doesn't have to involve family planning. Sorry, I, sh I should have said this. But much of it does. And, uh, and these are all organizations, and there are many more, that are taking this approach just now. Nature Uganda is doing a um, project in the north of Uganda to protect endangered cranes. And part of that is family planning and women's empowerment in the area where they, where they are. Chase Africa are, are very good friends of ours, and we actually um, partially support their work through a crowdfunding platform. Um, they started off um, planting trees as a way of, of achieving conservation. But they realize there's no point in planting trees if the people who live near where the trees are need to burn them for firewood or clear the land for grazing. What they now do is they offer family planning um, in Kenya and Tanzania? Uganda, <laughs> thank you. Um, Blue Ventures, similar work, uh, comprehensive work in Madagascar. And the Cheetah Conservation Fund um, just uh, 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 last year announced that it was going to, going to introduce a plan in Namibia and other places. Um, cheetah populations, I think I'm right in saying when I did this, have declined by 90% this century. There's only 7,000 left, left in the wild. Uh, and Cheetah Conservation Fund explained there the obvious reasons why it's a problem and why it's a solution. Um, and a lot of this PhD work is, is done under a well, under the guise of with a population sustainability network, um, which is an, an organization that works on that PHE uh, ideas, and it has not, uh, most of those organizations are part of it. Also, um, so some large environmental organizations are. And David Johnson, who's their, um, uh, who's their director, um, makes the point uh, really clearly, which I'll let you read rather than reading it for myself. I think the message there, everyone wins, and it goes back to the no regret solutions, how you, how you help people and it helps biodiversity. But there is a downside, or, or the, which, is, which is some people have, have resistance to, to that. Um, any discussion about trying to provide support for family planning is often seen as being anti-poor or, or, uh, or anti-poverty. It isn't. It's about providing choices. And this is the thing. What Chase say is where they go, you know, they, they, can't, they can't keep up with demand for, for people who want, to, who want to use their services. This is about empowering people. It's about things that, that, they, that they want. And um, lastly, going back to, to the big picture, well, what, how, how can things change? Um, the Convention for, on Biological Diversity, forgive me again, it's just helpful for me. Who's familiar with the Convention on Biological diversity. Yeah, I mean, there's no particular reason that people should be, but it was, it was um, started in 1992, originally in 1992, at the same time as the more, much more f um, famous um, uh, convention on uh, climate change, United Nations Framework on Climate Change. And its goal is essentially to have biodiversity safe by 2050, to brutally praise it. Um, and it set, I think, 2010, a set of targets for, to be achieved by, by 2020. Um, they included, uh, to give one example that I can remember, um, that all threatened species at that point in 2010 should have been um, preserved from extinction. Uh, that's not going to happen, as I think everyone in this room knows. And of those 20 targets, probably most of them won't be met, unfortunately. But the program goes on. It's, 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 it's long-term uh, vision is for 2050. Um, and Right now, the 2020 period is, is, is obviously, the 2020 deadline is, is nearing, it's getting close. So the process is now, has now started, has been going for a little while, about, well, what happens after 2020? What does it look like? Um, and none of these targets um, specifically refer to population. 
and we've already submitted to the process, the ongoing process for, for a convention on biological diversity renewal uh, proposals that population needs to be considered and also they should give consideration to introducing a protocol specifically uh, about population and population dynamics, the way, the way it changes. Uh, and we will be doing more work on this. Uh, and I would say for those of you who are in the, the biology or biological world just now, uh, um, or biodiversity sphere, You'll probably be familiar with this. It, uh, it's, it's very important in any um, particular institutions which can get involved in this process of, of, of the Convention on Biological Diversity, the post-2020. Um, it would be great if you could support things uh, in that way. So um, this is where the, 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 um, uh, the discussion doesn't necessarily turn cheerful. Um, for those who are wondering, uh, this is the uh, announcement of the new royal baby. This is the way you announce a new royal baby. You put one of these in the grounds of Buckingham, Buckingham Palace uh, earlier this year. Um, we obviously wish the new royal baby a happy life with very little international travel. Um, <laughs> right. So, so where are we and what does the future look like? Again, a slide which has got a lot of text on it for which I apologize, but I think it's important to see what, what very authoritative reports are saying. Uh, as part of my job, I get to have to read these things, and they just tumble out one after another, after another, after another, telling us how bad the situation is. Um, could I also just ask, world scientist warning, who's heard of that? That's better, okay. <laughs> okay, that's good. This was a warning that was a paper that was appeared in um, Bioscience in 2017, um, uh, led by a biodiversity specialist, um, uh, actually. Uh, they put it up for signatures, um, and 15,000 scientists signed it at the time, 20,000 have now, now si signed up to it. And what it said was in 1992, there was a world scientist warning to humanity. In the 25 years since then, all the indicators that they identified for environmental health have got worse except one, which is ozone-depleting substances. Everything else has got worse. There's their message. Let me just read it. Widespread misery and catastrophic biodiversity loss. There is, we have to have an alternative to business in, as usual. The IPCC 1.5 degree report that came out in October. Rapid and far-reaching transitions in energy, land, and infrastructure. Unprecedented in terms of scale, but not necessarily in terms of speed. I heard a fantastic, um, someone said something fantastic at climate change. Um, March that we went on a little while ago. Uh, I, I, don't know whether anyone's, I don't know whether it was original, but they said, what we need is a transformation on the scale of the Industrial Revolution at the speed of the Digital Revolution, which I thought was a brilliant piece of writing. And then here, the Eat Lancet report. Food systems can provide win-win diet to everyone, but only uh, new, uh, adoption, rapid adoption, numerous changes, unprecedented global collaboration and commitment, nothing less than a great food transformation. I talked about the good news that we can feed up to, te up to 10 billion people. We can only do this with really fundamental changes to the way we consume and produce food just now. The same message coming through in all these things. And then, literally, this morning, uh, this is something you may, may have heard on the radio. The uh, Institute for Public Policy Research, a UK-based th based think tank, produced a report. Uh, this, is a, this is a crisis. Um, and, we're, and subtitled The Age of Environmental Breakdown. Again, we're seeing unprecedented scale. Window of opportunity to avoid catastrophic outcomes is rapidly closing. And these are some of the catastrophic outcomes which you will hear again and again talking about climate change, biodiversity loss, soil, soil erosion, these, these kinds of things. Um, potential collapse of social and economic systems. And actually, I think one of the people who express that most clearly is, is uh, oh, actually, um, we'll go this, we'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. So what are we going uh, to do about it? Again, looking at some people talking about the Lancet Commission, um, require hard work, political will, and many resources. Delay will increase the likelihood of serious, even disastrous consequences. You read this report, and it's really sobering, but really valuable reading the, the, the Lancet report. And it just says, again, you can't leave this to the market. You can't leave it to people preferring to, to, to change, change their, their diets. You have to get in and get involved right now, is what they're saying. And then at the launch of the 1.5 degree IPCC report in October, one of the co-chairs 
uh, Jim Skay, I presume um, that's announced, uh, talked, about, talked about this. Again, hard choices. Um, they show it can be done, only just, but people need to want to do it. Um, and this, I think, is really important. All options need to be exercised. The idea you can leave anything out is not possible. And there, obviously, I point to population again. But as I was saying earlier on, all these long words are, uh, are expressed probably more clearly here. And that's what David Attenborough said at the launch of COP24, the, the climate change discussions there. The, the collapse of our civilizations is on the horizon. I can say to you, and I know other people in this room share this view, that as part of my job, I absolutely believe that to be true. Absolutely believe that to be true. I mean, if David Attenborough says it, that's probably good enough, good enough for everyone, but you look at all the indicators, and, and that is absolutely a plausible scenario for, the, for a future that I might live to see, but certainly my son will live to see if I, uh, see if I don't. That's, and when you read all these reports, as I do, there are two words that come out again and again and again and again. That one and that one. But we are looking at catastrophe. And the only way to avert it is transformation. And those words are just there over and over and over again. So, getting even more cheerful. So, uh, I was born in the 60s. Uh, I, I was a, a young man in, in, the, in the 1980s, in the time of the Cold War. And I used to lie awake at night, as a lot of us did, worrying about, about Armageddon. And there were two um, films that... Have, Who's, who's seen either of these films? You'd have to be quite old to have done so. Yeah, or, or, or perhaps not. Um, that kept a lot of us awake at night e e in those times. Threads was about a nuclear attack, and it was based on what happened in Sheffield. Showed the consequences of that in Sheffield. This came out in about 1986. And then this one, the day after, was based, in, was based in the States. And bizarrely, it was on, I stumbled across it on cable television um, a, little, uh, a little while ago, um, and watched it again. Um, uh, and, and it was, even though well, nuclear holocaust is, is still possible, but it's a lot, lot less likely than it was, but it was horrifying. It frightened me uh, as, as much, not as much as the first time, because the first time I really believed, uh, really believed it could happen. And that scene there is it's set near Kansas City, um, and the, uh, where there are many missile silos, and the people in Kansas, uh, Kansas City are going about their daily business while tensions are arising in the world and suddenly they see this. And one of the characters says to one of the others, if ours are up in the air, that means theirs are up in the air. And, and we've got 30 minutes until they land. This is where we are now. Environmentally, ecologically, the missiles are already in the air. They're already heading for us. The one advantage that we've got is that there is nothing that people in Kansas in that film can do about it, but there are things that, that we can do about it, but we absolutely have to. Those missiles are in the air, and they're heading for us. Nuclear holocaust could be avoided by people doing nothing, not pressing the button. Environmental catastrophe can only be avoided by doing something, by, taking, uh, by making changes. So, to finish up, our patron expressed our position better than any of the rest of us ever could. All our problems become easy to solve with fewer people and harder with more people. When he said that, we were already in an environmental crisis. Things are getting worse, or at least we're recognizing how things are getting worse just now. So the, thing, the only thing that I would add to his great words is that key word that came out that I was talking about before is transformation. Fundamental transformation in the way we live and the choices that we make. And that includes in thinking about population. The things we're doing on population are not enough just now, as they're not on climate change, as they're not on biodiversity loss, but they're all positive and they all help. Okay, that concludes my lecture with two, um, two other things. One is, um, I have to make a plug for this. Um, which is taking place in where people are a great deal more expert than I am. We'll be talking about biodiversity at our conference in April. Um, uh, and uh, I can tell you that, fingers crossed, uh, we're going to have a video um, message from Jane Goodall to open the, the conference. It's going to be really good. Uh, I hope it's going to be more cheerful at the end than my talk has been. And then, lastly, my final message to you with thank you is this. Thank you.
And I think something which is we get all the time, we're called po population matters. We're the only organization in this, in this country working on population, professional organization, working on population in this country. There aren't many of them across the world. Population is fundamental. You add more people, you add more emitters, you add more consumers, you add more people needing space, you add more people needing, needing food. It's fundamental. But, but we really hate, the fact that we focus on population doesn't mean that we're blind to everything else. There's an awful situation, you see it on Twitter all the time, where people say, oh, it's population, and then you get a bunch of people saying, no, it's veganism if we all went vegan, or we get rid of fossil fuels. I, I take you back to what the, the, the comment from the IPCC chair, Jim Skay. All options have to, be, have to be considered. Nothing can be left off the table. Let's not set up a competition between one, between one solution uh, and another. But do also remember what, what I said earlier on. It's the people who are born tomorrow and next week or more, to, be more, more, to be more helpful in 10 months' time because there's nothing we're going to be able to do about the people being bo born next week. We'll be around and having an environmental impact for 70, 80 years, hopefully. Uh, hopefully, so you can't you can't roll back population growth. Let, let once it's done, once so it's about preventing. It's about having people be able to make the choice to stop those people being born. So whether population is the most important thing, clearly it's an underlying thing to everything. But the, the notion that somehow you're obsessive about population, if you talk about it, the problem is that not enough people are. WWF aren't talking about it in the Living Pla Planet report. They're talking about consumption as though that is completely isolated from, from population. We uh, talked earlier on, I didn't address it specifically, but about breaking the taboo. We've seen how the solutions to, to, to population are positive solutions that improve people's lives, that help people. There is no reason for not talking about population, for not doing all, all those things. And it's scandalous, frankly, that, that we should be pra practically the only people who are talking about it. I, speaking personally as a vegan of 25 years um, and an animal rights campaigner, and an I feel strongly about this issue, but I think it should also be clear here that the the... World Resources Institute report, the Eat Lancet Commission report, they didn't say go vegan, but what they said is we need to eat a fraction of the amount of that on meat that on average is, be is being eaten. And their job was literally dozens of people from across the world asking the question over a very long period of time, asking the question about how we need to change. This is one of the points I made. You know, this is, first of all, this is not about stopping people doing things. People given the choice will usually choose a smaller family. Though once you get above a certain level of affluence, then people start thinking about, about larger families again. So all those things are all positive. The women's empowerment, the, you know, the, the education, these are things that people are clamoring for um, uh, you know, in, in the places where fertility is high. At, at the moment, and, po and population isn't just about large numbers of babies. It is about, talk about exactly about consumption, about our behaviour here. We talked before about the value of one fewer American or one fewer British person in, in, in climate change terms. And here in this country, and a lot of our work is about promoting this message directly to people in the developed world, in the rich world, where we live, to say the choices that you make about the size of your family are disproportionately beneficial. And then the other point I'd make as far as that sort of colonial um, kind, of, uh, kind of thing goes is that's, well, it is an argument you sometimes hear, uh, you'll sometimes hear from, from a political point of view from the global south, but overwhelmingly people in the, in the, in the, in the global south, they're not shy of, talk, of talking about these issues. They absolutely understand the pressures of population on their countries. There's a, there's a quote um, that we use from uh, Malawi's Minister of Finance, and she said, as a country, we've made great strides economically. All of it has been dissipated by population, uh, by population growth, the importance of doing this. So you ask the, the, the people who are affected, uh, you know, and there are governments in, in, in the just as there are in Hungary, who are, make, who, are saying, mm. who are saying, well, we need to boost our population, but actually, overwhelmingly, the choices that they're making are the positive cho choices. We don't, we don't, we don't need to, <laughs> you know, because people are saying that in those countries, we shouldn't be going into them uh, in, in those countries. I mean, so our, our primary audience at, at the moment is here in this country. We do want to do work abroad. We do want to work with partners abroad. And we do in particular want to bring out that, that get that understanding that, that people in the global south and governments in the global south are 
you know, ha have this understanding and, and want these changes. And just quickly on your question about, uh, about culture, the countries with the lowest birth rates, actually Malta is the lowest, the large countries with the lowest birth rates in Europe are Portugal and Italy, both Catholic countries. Mm -hmm. One of the most successful family planning initiatives ever was in Iran under Ayatollah Khomeini, mm -hmm. a fundamentalist Islamic regime because he deemed that it was in the interest of the country uh, in, you know, in, in order to do that. So those religious and cultural things are much, much more malleable than, 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 yeah, than people true. think and change comes. That's a, that's a really big um, question to answer, but just, just think quickly. Yes, we do absolutely believe that, that, the, uh, that the UK needs to have a population policy, a sustainable population, uh, sustainable population policy. You can't go, this will, uh, my boss put it to me, you can't go around telling other countries that they should be addressing population without, without looking in your own backyard. And in fact, I didn't have time to talk about biodiversity I in the UK, but the um, State of Nature report, and I think 2016, described the UK as one of the most nature depleted countries in the world. That's pretty shocking. <laughs> That we are, we are so fr from, a, from a biodiversity standpoint. Now, of course, there are multiple reasons, but the reasons here are similar to the one, uh, the, you know, to, every, to everywhere. So yes, we should be now having a national, uh, a national policy. Um, even the words national policy make me, as a kind of lefty, go a bit woo. <laughs> but, but, but the fact is that that's the level at which decisions get get made. We are, got, we are uh, active work over the next year will involve trying to promote an international agreement and within this country where, where we are based, getting a rational, ethical, volunteer, evidence-based population policy uh, in this case that, that looks at the, at the negatives which, in, which, you which you alluded to. China, you know, the, we believe this is about choice. China's coercive policy. I, I wish I had a slide that showed how the um, how fertility was coming down in China before they even in, in, introduced that policy. Of course, of course it, had, uh, it had some effect. But yeah, it has le led to consequences in terms of um, things like aging, economic consequences. That's such a big, big subject to go into. But the, the message on, on, on population is that if you, if you grow your number of people in order to grow, to grow your economy or look after your old people, you just have to keep doing it. It just spirals and spirals and spirals. You can't deal with the problem of old people by bringing in more young people or, or by bringing in, I mean, by migration or, by, or, 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 or through birth rates uh, because, it just, because they become old and then you need more and more people. It's absolutely unsustainable. Scheme. So you have to think creatively and intelligently about how you deal with that demo, demographic sort of change um, that, that, uh, that's, that's going on. It's obviously, it's obviously an entire subject in itself, but I hope that's some answer to you. There, there, there are, there are um, they're, they're all small. We, I mean, we're not big. We, we have four full-time staff and, and a number of, of part-time staff. Um, there are a number of organizations in the United States. Our favorite is World Population Balance, but there are others who are doing World Population ba Balance. They have a great side on called Growth Busters, where they all dress as the Ghostbusters, um, just to just challenge that growth I idea. Um, there are in Canada and Australia, both have, um, have organizations doing, doing similar things. There are a number I in Europe. But one of the things we were looking at doing some international work um, last year to, to, to actively go out and look for them. One of the things we found that actually beyond the English speaking world, it was very hard to identify organizations in particular in the global south. Uh, and we are absolutely certain that organizations who've got this interest are out there. The problem is that they don't have the word population here in their names. And one of the tasks that we are going to be undertaking in, uh, over the next year or so is trying to identify those partners and, and work with them. So yes, in the English speaking world, well, there are similar, but, but you know, in, in total, the number of people working professionally on this issue in the English-speaking world is probably 25. And, and you know, that, that's you know, that's that that's the scale of the challenge. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I've got. You know, absolutely no disagreement with what you're saying at all. I mean, you know, it was, it was a fly through the things. In fact, we're looking at supporting next year a project in Kenya, which is specifically about actually empowering boys and, and, and making them, uh, changing their attitudes to, uh, to reproduction. If I could just say, we're not going somewhere and doing it. That's a Kenyan organization that is doing that in Kenya, you know, with, with a, a little bit of, 
uh, of support from from outside. But yeah, of course it needs to. I mean, that, that's I hope one of the messages that that um, that everyone will take away is population is an issue everywhere. Family size is an issue uh, is an issue everywhere, and the the problems can be in different extents. The threats can be in different extents, but of course it needs addressed everywhere.